Some people are going to watch this video and say, this guy is absolutely nuts. But here's the crazy thing. Despite this project research method going against everything that you've been taught up to this point, it works and I have data to prove it. Seriously, check this out. I use this exact product research technique that I'm about to teach you to discover one of my latest products. And to my surprise, it quickly became ranked as the number one new release in this category within just two weeks. Now I know that's not something you commonly hear from people who teach you product research techniques. They typically just tell you how you can make hundreds and thousands of dollars because the top seller is, and they don't have any data to support it. This technique, I have data to support it. Over the next six weeks of selling this product, I sold over 184 units and profited over $1,300 on a $400 investment. Now, what does that mean? That means that I made a 225% return on my investment. These results speak for themselves. So let's take a look at this method. I can teach you step-by-step -step on how I actually found this product and you can find similar types of products. And I'll leave it up to you as the viewer if this was just a luck of the draw or if there's actually some logic to this madness. So let's start out with a quick fact, and this will really bring us into the main issue that we're trying to solve with this product research method. And I'm not sure if you know, but there's actually over 3,700 new sellers joining Amazon each and every day. Yeah, that, you know, that's quite a lot. And the vast majority of them, they're looking to sell these high demand and low competition products, which you know honestly makes complete sense. And that's what I've done for my business up until this point. However, if you have all these new sellers eyeing up those limited, high demand, and low competition niches, all looking to sell the same type of product, it's only a matter of time before that product and that niche becomes oversaturated by the time that you actually begin to sell that product in that area. So that's kind of the, the issue that we're facing here today. And um, you know, this really brings me to my first main point and the principle for this method, and that is to find areas on Amazon that new sellers aren't joining. Yes, we are looking for areas on Amazon that new sellers could care less about and that they're not joining. So in other words, we'll be targeting the high competition niches with this research method, but we're looking for ones in particular that have high demand as well, and it also gives us an opportunity to differentiate the product. Yeah, it sounds strange, it's definitely odd, it's not the intuitive approach to this, but you know, based on my results from what I've experienced and the data that I have to prove it, you know, this actually tends to work out. So let's head over to Jungle Scout and we're gonna run through the filters on how you can apply this to your own method. This also works with other software like Helium 10, so you can apply the same principle to whatever software you have. So let's begin by looking at the categories that we want to uh, find these niches in. I've selected the ones that are the most beginner friendly. They require the least amount of documentation to become approved to sell a product in that niche, you know, such as a children's product certificate or a CPC for a baby category or um, some other categories, you definitely need a safety data sheet and SDS. Uh, but these categories right here are the most beginner friendly. And I do recommend focusing on these before you look to expand to other categories. Moving over to the right hand side here, let's take a look at the average monthly unit sold and the monthly search volume. Um, in other words, this is our demand that we're filtering down to. Now I have these values at a very high min level. So average monthly unit sold is at 2,750 and the monthly search volume is at 110,000 monthly searches. Yes, that is correct, that is a lot. What I've learned from my experience is that these values tend to provide the best opportunity to find a product that has high demand and it also gives the best opportunity to find a product that is going to meet the, the following criteria which we'll take a look at now. So I put these at the min levels. Obviously, if you have higher than 2,750 average monthly units sold, that's a good thing. If you find a niche that has higher search volume than 110,000 monthly searches, that's also a great thing. These are just our min, so we'll leave the max untouched there. Next, let's move on to the average monthly price. I have this uh, price between $12 for the min and the maximum of $45. Now, the logic here is that $12 is typically the uh, least amount that we can sell a product for and still easily achieve a 35% profit margin. That's uh, large and due because if you sell something that's under $12, your minimum FBA fee, I think right now is about $3.70 or close to $4. That's already taken over 25% of your profit margin just to an FBA fee. You still have 15% for the referral fee and then your cost of goods sold and advertising, it's gonna make it very difficult. So I recommend $12 as the min. And then the reason why I have $45 for the maximum is because anything beyond that, you start to get involved with larger size products. Now this doesn't apply to every single product. Obviously you have electronics that are hundreds of dollars and very small like a camera, 
But uh, from my experience through Amazon, the larger that sales price is, typically it's a direct relationship with the size of the product. And if we start to get into that large standard or oversized product categories, um, your FBA fees are gonna skyrocket and your storage fees as well. So let's keep that between $12 and $45. Niche score, four to a six. Yeah, that's odd, right? The reason why I have this as a four uh, is because anytime you see a product niche with very high or high competition um, using Jungle Scout, it typically has a niche score of a four or a five. The reason why I put that upper limit of a, a six is because anything beyond a six, you start to get into the uh, low competition area and we're trying to filter those out because we're looking for those categories and those niches that these new sellers aren't easily attracted to. Okay, and then the search trends down here. We have the 30 day and the 90 day. Now there's two things I wanna point out here. One is we want the 30 day to be above 125 and we want the 90 day to be above 50. The core principle here is that we want our 30 day search trend to be much higher than our 90 day because this suggests that in the near term, we are looking at a product that is dramatically rising in search volume and in overall demand uh, versus a product that might have a not higher 90 day search trend compared to 30 day. You know, it might be on the tail end of its demand since the 30 day is less than the 90 day. So just keep that in mind. We want this 30 day to be a little bit higher so we can be closer to that dramatic increase in demand. And it typically suggests that in the near term, at least, we should still see that rise in overall demand. The reason why I selected 125 and 50, um, you know, they're somewhat arbitrary to be honest, they're just two numbers that I saw that were reasonable when I saw a good trend. It typically had above 125 for the 30 day. And then obviously with the 90 day being less, it was right around 50 to 60. So I just put 50 in there. All right, so down to the competition. This is gonna feel very weird when you're doing this because I bet you've never filtered just for high and very high competition. So make sure you adjust this to high and very high. That is the area and the niches that we're looking for. Seasonality, I'll leave this up to you. I have no issue selling a seasonal product as long as I understand when that seasonality occurs. Is it during the summer months? Is it during the winter months? Um, is it just a holiday? As long as you have awareness on that, there's no issue selling seasonal products. Too often I hear sellers tell you how, you know, stay away from the seasonal items, there's less demand. But as long as you understand the seasonality for your product and niche and you can stock, and uh, remove inventory as needed during those seasons. Yeah, there's no issue in doing so, and I honestly encourage it. All right, so the last two here, include keywords, exclude keywords. Just leave this blank unless uh, you wanna remove a season or a holiday. You know, we have July 4th coming up. I might type in Independence or July 4th just to remove those things that you know I don't wanna sell an Independence Day product, so I can exclude those keywords, and therefore those niches won't pop up. All right, and then we'll go over here, we'll select exclude top brands so we don't get brands like Apple and Nike popping up in the search results. And then we can go ahead and we can click search. After clicking search, you'll be met with this exhaustive list, probably one to two pages of just some bad niches. You know, you typically look at these uh, when you're filtering through your results and you see very high competition, a very low niche score, and uh, you're just gonna start to think, yeah, you know, this is not something I wanna be selling it. But just wait, I know this is strange, Let's go through at least one of these so I can explain the logic and kind of what I'm looking for. So with this entire set, I usually filter everything in descending order with the monthly search volume. I, I found this to be a much better predictor of overall demand and we're looking for a very high demand product. So higher the search volume, higher the demand. So take your time going through this list and find something that looks like there's an opportunity that we can find a, a unique product and we can differentiate it. I'm not going to waste your time here and go through you know, four or five of these. I've already pre-selected one that we can take a look at now and I can kind of run through it the whole way to finding a product and why that would actually be a good product for this type of product research method. So the niche that we'll be taking a look at for this example is the oil dispenser bottle for kitchen. We have extremely high uh, metrics as you can see here for demand, over 200,000 monthly search volume and over you know, close to 4,000 for the average monthly unit sold. Excellent, right? This does meet our criteria of having that 30 day trend higher than the 90 day trend. So 313% and 224. Overall, we're seeing a significant increase in demand over the past one to three months, which is great. Very high competition and a low niche score. It's good for this, right? And then I, what I like to check too, before I actually take a look at the niche and the Amazon uh, products that are on the first listing page, is that just we have a, a consistent trend in average units sold here. Taking a look down below, you can see, you know, it typically just fluctuates between 
1500 to about 4000 average monthly units sold, which is what we're in right now for this month. So that's good news. Consistent is good news for this type of method. Okay, so after validating those few things, let's take a look at the first listing page. And I'll tell you some things to keep an eye out for. Uh, the first one, and I know this isn't a perfect example, but as I'm scrolling through, I wanna make sure that there aren't any listings that have more than 10,000 reviews. This one's an exception, it has 21,000, so this wouldn't be ideal, but you know, you're never gonna get the, the best of everything and everything just fit perfectly in any type of product research method. So I'll scroll down through here, and as I'm scrolling, I'm trying to understand a few things. One, what is uh, the common product that is being sold? Is there a commonality between all these sellers and these designs? Because our idea here is to sell something that's different and to stand out in front of all this competition, uh, which would just kind of remove us from that highly competitive area of this. Um, scrolling down here, these are sponsored ones, hundred, couple hundred reviews, and they're on the first listing page. That's good for advertising. And then I'll just keep taking a look. So, you know, I see a very common theme. We see some of these products that are very unique in design. And we also see some that are you know, nearly identical, which would be these glass ones that we're seeing everywhere. So whenever we look to find a product for this niche, I'm looking for a product that is very unique to this market. It solves the problem for this niche and that customer. It gives us the best opportunity to stand out. Real quick, I just noticed this. There's a non-sponsored listing here with only four reviews on the first listing page. Uh, so that's excellent. This must be a new product. And as you can see, it's a very different product from what we've commonly saw throughout this first listing page. And you know, this might be actually someone practicing this technique and successfully doing it. So let's take a look at Alibaba. And I actually came across a product that is not commonly sold on um, in that niche. And honestly, I did not come across one that was even similar to the features or the design. So this is a two-in-one oil dispenser. We have two different volumes. We have one here, which you could put something like vinegar in or a different type of olive oil blend. And then you have the larger volume, the exterior um, from this, this one right here. Uh, you could put your olive oil in there. So you can make even a basalmic glaze or something. You know, This is something that's very unique, very different from what's commonly sold on Amazon. And this is exactly what I did for my own golf towel products. I found a, a golf towel that was not sold on Amazon. It was creative, it was unique, and that is why I was successful in selling that and becoming eventually that number one new release. So I appreciate you checking out this method. I, I know it's very strange and it's different from what you're accustomed to, but you know, from the data that I have to support it and the success that I've had with it, I thought I'd share this with you just to give you a different perspective um, instead of the common high demand and low competition niches in product research methods.